When people talk about insects in the veggie garden, they often think of pests, but I've been chatting to Dr. Paul Horn today. He's an entomologist, and the one thing that's really clear is that there are some bugs, insects, that you absolutely want in your vegetable garden. We're gonna be talking about the most common beneficial insects, how to identify them, how to spot their eggs, and perhaps most importantly, how to attract them to your veggie gardens at home. More specifically, we are talking ladybirds, we are talking lacewings, we are talking hoverflies, and of course, your butterflies and your bees. Who'd have thought we wanted maggots in our garden? Yeah, well, it's... <laughs> it's... Spear-sucking maggots. <laughs> I think if I was an aphid, I would be terrified of them. Definitely. So. Paul, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. I think anyone who has a veggie garden pretty quickly learns that insects are something they need to understand. Otherwise they can run into all sorts of problems. But you are someone who understands this better than anyone. You're an entomologist, what does that mean? So an entomologist is simply someone who studies or looks at insects. And a lot of my work uh, is in agriculture because as you say, there's insects that are pests and people want to know how to deal with them. Today we're talking about beneficial insects. Are there some people who don't actually realise that's even a thing? So most <laughs> people would recognise that maybe ladybirds and uh, butterflies, you know. Bees. Bees. Bees, of yeah. course. Yeah. And a whole lot of other insects are beneficial because they pollinate crops. But beneficial in terms of what I look at are the things that are biological control agents, so they're the insects and mites that eat the pest insects and mites, so they're predators or parasites. What are the most common beneficial insects that someone in Australia might find in a veggie garden? Well, if we look at the adult stages, we would find ladybirds, people would recognise ladybirds. Uh, hoverflies, they're very, very common. They look like little bees, and they typically, the adult flies, they hover and they hang still in the air, usually over flowers because they're nectar feeders. But the juvenile stages of hoverflies are predatory and the maggots will eat things like aphids or mealybugs. So we've got ladybirds, hoverflies. What else might people find in the garden? So some of the most common ones are lacewings. There's two that are really common, brown lacewings and green lacewings. And brown lacewings are a bit smaller they're about eight or nine millimetres long. Green lacewings as adults might be twice that. Green lacewings, people often see them at their windows at night. They come to light and they have golden eyes. So a lot of people would have seen green lacewing eggs or at least the hatched green lacewing eggs. So the green lacewing female, when it lays its eggs, it touches the surface of a leaf or whatever it lays its egg on and draws it out and it's like an instant setting glue and then it lays its egg which is a little ball on top so it lays an egg on a string and that string hardens instantaneously when the eggs are freshly laid they're a sort of light green color and then just before they hatch they're a gray color and once they have hatched they're pure white so if people see these distinctive eggs with the spot and a string, they mm -hmm. should leave them be. Leave them alone. Leave them alone, because they're yeah. the, am I allowed to call them bugs? They're not bugs, are they? Because I've learned bugs are sucking. So bugs is a general insects. term people use for insects. <laughs> for an entomologist, true bugs are sucking insects. Okay, we'll call them insects. <laughs> they are one of the insects that we want in our garden. So they'll get rid of aphids. What else will they eat? So they're very important in actually in viticulture, in vineyards, they're the main predator that controls the main pest, which is a caterpillar uh, called light brown apple moth. So when they hatch out of the egg, they're a little predator, a tiny little predator, and they've got hollow jaws at the front, and they will grab their prey, whether it's a caterpillar or an aphid, something soft-bodied, and then they just suck the liquid out. Nasty little things if you're a pest but completely harmless to us they're not going to bite you 
Okay. No, I don't think I'd be worried about a bite from one of these. They're very, very small. You're describing them as quite vicious though. I think if I was an aphid, I would be terrified of them. Definitely. So. Is there any way that you can specifically attract lacewings to your garden? Lacewings will come anyway. So you probably don't need to attract them. If there's food there, they will stay. If there's no food, they will keep going. Having what we call a complex understory, like not just bare ground. Um, so where there's a, a habitat for a, a range of things to live, it gives them an alternative food source often. And so one thing we ask vineyard managers to do is not to go through and in springtime and mow the entire thing all at once, mm. but to mow every second row. Mm -hmm. And so that Keep the weeds. Weeds or grasses, or, yeah. you know, that we're not asking them to create a weed problem just do it like two weeks alternatively and that means there's a pollen source for things like predatory mites so even though the predatory mites eat other mites they will also feed on pollen and so if there's no flowering grasses there's less pollen it's not going to be a total change but it will supplement the uh, the beneficial population so let's go back to ladybirds Everyone's very familiar with the red ladybird with black spots, mm -hmm. but there are a few different life stages where they look completely different. Talk me through that. Well, first of all, there's, there's different species of ladybirds. And so we have what we call the common ladybirds. If you went to New South Wales or Queensland, they would have, or, it, or Tasmania, you know, they have different species. They're all roughly the same, but the larvae look very, very different. No. Now, for those who uh, don't understand, the, the larvae no. are the babies. So, the juvenile stages. Yep. Yeah. You're like, no, that's not the term. <laughs> I'm not calling them babies. Well, actually, if I go back one step, ladybirds usually lay eggs in a little cluster and they're usually yellow to orange and they look very, very much like cabbage white butterfly eggs. Ooh. But cabbage white butterfly always lay their eggs singly. They might lay multiple eggs on a leaf, but they're never clustered together. Whereas ladybird eggs that look the same, they would always be, you know, 10 of them or so in a, in a group. So you've got to be really careful with that because I will sometimes look out for cabbage white butterfly eggs and remove them. So basically what you're saying, if you ever see a cluster, don't touch them. Yes. If they're, if they're a tight cluster all together, they're probably ladybird eggs. Mm. They're the same size and colour as a cabbage white, but they'd be scattered all over the leaf. Are there specific ways that you can attract ladybirds other than having food for them? The generalist ladybird will eat a whole range of stuff, but it will only lay eggs where there's a suitable food source. So the ones that eat aphids, uh, you can attract them, but if there's no aphids, they won't, they won't breed. So you can attract ladybirds by having aphids. Exactly. So you might think your aphids <laughs> are a problem, but maybe they're not. <laughs> well, if you leave one plant, if you've got a whole line of rose bushes, if you leave one with aphids on it, you'll actually probably be really surprised that the beneficials will take over and they will actually be a, that'll be a nursery plant for beneficial species that will protect all the others. Now, I will just add for everyone watching at home, we are doing a specific video also on aphids and caterpillars. So if you want to learn more about aphids and caterpillars, that link is going to be in the description. If it's not there yet, it'll be uploaded in the next 24 hours. How could people identify a juvenile ladybird? Um, or a ladybird baby, as I'm going to call it. Okay, the ladybirds, as adults, most people recognise them. And the eggs we've just talked about, the larvae or the juvenile stages, they can be mistaken for, for grubs, like caterpillars, you know, they're not. They have three pairs of legs at the front and they've got a long, long body and they're quite, they're quite flat. Uh, but they also usually have the similar colours to the adults. So they might have a black body with a few yellow spots on them. The colours for ladybirds are important. So in the insect world, colours are used as, as warnings. And so if you think of a European wasp, it's yellow and black. Mm. There's strong contrasting colours. It's saying, don't touch me because I'm dangerous. I'm mm. going to sting you. Ladybirds are orange and black, which is warning colours. Obviously, they're not going to sting you. 
it's a warning to a bird that might want to eat them that they taste horrible. Oh. And so a bird will only ever eat one ladybird and it will never touch another one. Oh. So the colour for the population is actually their protection. Because birds tend to love red things like your strawberries and your raspberries and your red flowers. Yeah, yeah. Often uh, people ask me what we should plant to encourage insects and well it's not an absolute rule. Often red red flowers are pollinated by birds and uh, insects prefer other other colours. Mm. I love birds in the garden but I'm definitely yeah. trying to keep them away from my raspberries and strawberries at the moment so I might keep an eye out not to plant any other red flowers I guess around there. Yeah, if you had red bottle brushes they'd love that. Mm. Now hoverflies, we've talked about them a little bit. What do hoverflies look like and what are the sort of key identifying factors in the different life stages that, that people might be able to use to determine them from other insects? Hoverfly adults, they're pretty easy to distinguish when they're flying because they stand still in the air. But if they rest on a flower, um, they often are yellow and black colours like, like bees and so sometimes people mistake them and call them little bees but they're flies. Flies only have two wings, whereas bees have four. So oh. flies as a group, that their name is Diptera, Di is two, Terra is wing. So it's a characteristic of the group. You would never see that. You just notice that they they hold their wings out and they've got yellow and black bodies. They hover. And they hover. Yellow, black hoverers. I yeah. think we can remember that. Yeah. The larvae are the, the you know, the juvenile stages are maggots, so they're, they're flies. Um, and even though they're maggots, they, which means they don't have a head, any obvious sex head, they don't have any legs, but they're quite capable of walking around the canopy of a plant and they find aphids and eat them. Their mouth parts are like a spear, so when they come across an aphid, they just stab it and suck out the, the liquid. Who'd have thought we wanted maggots in our garden? Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's... Spear sucking maggots. <laughs> Are their eggs distinctive? Are they, how, how do they sort of reproduce? The eggs of hoverflies that we want and brown lacewing eggs, so not the green lacewing eggs on stalks, but brown lacewings and hoverflies lay white eggs that are oval shaped and they lay them flat on the leaf. So if you usually on the underside of a leaf. So if you, if you turn the leaf over and there's lots of little white specks, like, like Tic Tacs, only really, really tiny, then they're probably either lace wings or hoverfly eggs. And in practice, it doesn't matter too much because the larvae that hatch out of those eggs, whether they're hoverflies or lace wings, are both gonna do the same thing. They're gonna eat aphids. Two more beneficial insects that I think everyone knows about, but I think they're worth covering just because they're so obvious, is bees and butterflies. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, can you explain to me why bees and butterflies are beneficial? And they're obviously not predators in the way that we've discussed the other insects, but yeah, why do we love bees and butterflies so much? So I think, most butterflies. <laughs> yes, it's most butterflies. So bees are easier. Like bees are pollinators and we need need to pollinate crops and so... Honey bees are an introduced species, but there's also a lot of native bees. Um, but yeah, people recognise bees as, as a good thing. Butterflies are the adult stage of a caterpillar. Mm. And so if that caterpillar is eating a vegetable that we want to grow in our garden, then it's a pest. Mm. And so cabbage white butterfly is the most common mm. but most other butterflies people just like them because they're they're attractive they're colorful and they're you know they're visible that people you can see them easily will a butterfly pollinate your zucchini as well as a bee will or not necessarily uh probably not as well mm. um butterflies and moths that that feed they have a very long proboscis and it's coiled up um, when it's at rest, and so they point it out. But unlike a bee or a hoverfly, which is covered in tiny little hairs, when they're feeding on the flower, they're walking around and they're picking up the pollen, which they then take to another one. Whereas I guess a, a butterfly is, is just a little bit more delicate and it's not going to do quite as good a job. 
So if someone was watching this and they were just starting to get their garden going and there was nothing growing, we're talking about bare space, and they could plant three things, you're, I know you're like, it's not that simple, it's never that simple. <laughs> but if you could go out now and plant three things in your garden that were going to attract beneficials and you're dealing with a blank space, what are you planting? Well, some of the common things which you might want to plant for other reasons anyway, might be things like coriander and parsley. And so if they were on the boundaries of where your garden is, they will grow and they'll self-sow. And the flowers last for quite a long time. And they're really good for uh, beneficial insects to, to feed on and, you know, to keep them. Other, the other ones, if you looked up, uh, what do I plant to attract insects? Queen Anne's lace is, uh, comes up quite a lot. And that's a, that's a decorative plant. It's an ornamental plant. So it looks nice. Um, so they're there to attract beneficial insects. A lot of people complain that coriander bolts too quickly, but that's probably a really good thing. Let yeah. it be. Yeah. And so I grow coriander uh, for eating, but as everyone that's tried to grow coriander knows, they bolt. But instead of pulling it out, I let it come to flower. And these, these flowers are actually really good to encourage hoverflies and parasitic wasps so instead of pulling it all out because I'm not going to eat any of it I just leave it. There's some ladybirds up here up in the flowers. Got a which... good one here actually. And so Paul you, you do this sort of thing as a job what sorts of people or businesses would employ you is it just large-scale operations or do you sort of deal with you know do you ever deal with individuals who come and get you out tell me a bit about your work. We work with anyone. Um, unfortunately, people pick up the phone and contact me usually when there's a crisis, mm -hmm. when their usual practices aren't working, and that could be small farms, could be large farms. We work with small family farms as well as uh, the large corporate farms. Also, I'm going to, um, Paul hasn't asked me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Can people access this online somewhere? Should be if it's Excellent. still in print. Yeah. I've found this fascinating which Paul wrote, Backyard Insects. I'll also work out where you can get it online and I will put a link in there. I've even been reading it to the kids, as I was telling you earlier, and they find it fascinating because so many of these you can find in your backyards in Australia and um, then work out exactly what you're looking at and what to do about it. I run garden tours in Melbourne, Australia at least every month. If that sort of thing appeals to you, hit the subscribe button. Also, if you found this video helpful, hitting like too can help other people find this video.